During the Second World War, Germany developed some basic surface-to-air missiles, which were called Flakraketen, a quite weird name, because literally translated it would mean anti-aircraft gun rocket. Now before we take a look at the various challenges and data, let's take a look at the development history. The first steps toward the development of an anti-aircraft missile goes back to 1932. This development was influenced by the Versailles Treaty, due to the restriction on certain weapon systems, but not for rockets. This was also one of the reasons for the development of the A4, better known as the V2. Still at this point in 1932 it was about unguided rockets. Yet in the beginning of the war in 1939 the requirements were extended to a radio controlled missile. In early 1941 the first tactical specifications were given by the Luftwaffe. Although two independent projects were started, the Luftwaffe leadership didn't provide much support. Additionally, a report in late 1941 laid out the limits and problems of a guided AA missile. As a result, the rocket interceptor project was prioritized. Although a Luftwaffe general heavily criticized this decision after the war, the historian Ralf Schabel notes that the cancellation was probably a sound decision, because it addressed both the challenge of the guidance system and the need of a proximity fuse. Yet in September 1942, Göring approved a new flag program that also included missiles. Offenbar waren sich weder der Oberbefehlshaber der Luftwaffe noch der General der Flakwaffe über die ungeheure Zersplitterung des deutschen Ingenieur- und Forschungspotenzials im Klaren, dass sie durch die Parallelentwicklungen der Flakraketen neben Interceptor, Strahlflugzeugen und Bodenbodenraketen des Heeres verursachten. Apparently, neither the Commander-in-Chief of the Luftwaffe nor the General of the Anti-Aircraft Weapon were aware of the tremendous fragmentation of German engineering and research potential caused by the parallel development of the AA missiles alongside the interceptor, the jet aircraft and the surface-to-surface -surface missiles of the army. Soon afterwards, a cooperation between the Luftwaffe and the Heer, the army, was initiated, since the army was already developing the V2. In early 1943, a major conference with leading members of military, industry, research and development was held. Several projects, including their feasibility and timetables, were discussed. Especially the members of the V2 program noted towards the general of the Flakwaffe that the guidance system was a major issue for the surface-to-air missile. So let's take a look at the technical challenges. In order to develop a proper surface-to-air missile, several key components are necessary. A guidance system, a warhead island with a proximity fuse, a control system and a propulsion system. Yet only the propulsion system was properly working. All other components were basically only known on a theoretical or rudimentary level. One major issue was the lack of a proper guidance system, because a radio-guided missile that was controlled by someone on the ground wasn't really an option, and a radar-guided variant was a major challenge. In 1943 experts noted that the proper trial version of a radar device would be ready only in 1945. Even if this could have been achieved, the accuracy would have probably been limited. Not to mention that the device needed to be included with the whole system. After all, an engine alone doesn't make for a working car. As a result, another main issue was the lack of a proximity fuse. The Erprobungskommando 25, the Field Trial Command 25, had experimented with various weapons like rockets, cannons and bombs against large bomber formations. But these weapons had a limited effect due to the necessity of direct hits. Other problems were the limited amount of knowledge of vertical flight characteristics, the high demands for quality and mass production and the fuel production, storage and transport. Now Bismarck will provide a closer look at some of the projects. Alright, so let's have a look at some of the missiles the Germans designed for anti-air duty with a radio controlled guidance system. Now a word of caution is advised, because these weapons were mainly prototypes that developed as tests were conducted. A lot of diverging stats and numbers can be found. Keep this in mind as I give you an introduction to some of these missiles. Let us start with the Wasserfall, the only supersonic missile in our selection. Literally translated, Wasserfall means waterfall or cascade. Essentially a miniature V2 in many ways. It had a height of 7.8 meters, a width of 2.5 meters and weighed 3.5 tons. It could reach speeds of just under 800 meters per second with enough fuel for 45 seconds of thrust. Taking off vertically, it mounted an explosive warhead of 100 kilograms. After the war, the design choices of the Wasserfall greatly influenced later surface-to-air and air-to-air -air missiles. Moving on to the Rheintochter, the first subsonic missile in the mix. The translation is a bit awkward, but essentially Rheintochter means daughter of the Rhine, the river that provides a natural border between Germany and France. 
Standing at 6.3 meters with a width of 3 meters, it was still one of the bigger rockets. Weighing 1.75 tons on the takeoff, it would be fired at an angle by using a launch carriage, achieving speeds of up to 310 meters per second. Having a thrust duration of 30 seconds, it launches itself at the enemy planes with a warhead containing around 150 kilograms of high explosive content. The Schmetterling or Butterfly is probably the most eccentric design. 3.6 meters tall and 2 meters wide, it is a light design with a total weight of 420 kilograms. It would be fired off at an angle, flying for around 50 seconds at up to 210 meters per second. However, it only contained a 42 kilogram warhead. Enzian was named after a mountain flower, the Gentian. The Enzian was a smaller, more horizontally challenged missile, standing at 3.5 meters with a width of 4 meters, bringing 1.5 tons to the scale. It could be fired vertically or at an angle by using a launch carriage and had enough fuel for 70 seconds of thrust and reached a speed of 280 meters per second. It had an impressive warhead of 550 kilograms, that's about a third of the total weight. Now if you're interested in more information on these missiles, check out my video on this topic. Of course, this was tech at its earlier stage, with many obstacles yet to be overcome. But let's cut back to Bernhard for more information. Besides the technical challenges, there were also various challenges on the organizational and strategic level. It is quite interesting that in German military doctrine the Schwerpunkt, focal point, was central and it was very well executed on the operational level. Yet on the grand strategic level, especially when it came to production, this principle was basically non-existent. The amount of parallel developments and shifting in prioritizations can partially attribute it to Hitler's decisions. Yet he was by far not the only one that couldn't make up his mind. In general, there was a constant struggle within the leadership about taking a defensive or offensive strategic approach. For instance, V2 and Bomber were offensive, where surface to air missiles and increased fighter production would have been defensive. And since Germany had a lack of manpower, resources and industrial capacity, a clear Schwerpunkt would have been mandatory but it was rarely followed on the grand strategic level. Yet this problem also persists on mid-level production and research. As mentioned before, the pool of qualified engineers and technicians was limited. After all, we should not forget that similar expertise was needed for various other projects like the V1, the V2, the Messerschmitt 262 and the Arado 234. Yet as you saw in Bismarck's part, there was not one, but several missiles in development. Yet it gets worse because there was also a discussion if it wouldn't be better to focus on guided missiles fired from planes instead of surface-to-air missiles. But the Luftwaffe leadership, surprise, continued both approaches. As a result, only 50% of the personal capacities for the developments could be provided. The historian Ralf Schabel notes that the reluctance of the leadership to focus on one or at least fewer projects was due to the lack of technical competence. Die Politik, möglichst keine Entwicklung zu vernachlässigen, war auf den Umstand zurückzuführen, dass sowohl Speer als auch Göring jede technische Kompetenz fehlte. Die beratenden Sachbearbeiter hielten dagegen natürlich jeweils ihr Projekt für das Beste. The policy of not neglecting any development was due to the fact that both Speer and Göring lacked any technical competence. The consultants were of course always convinced that their project was the best. Yet an interesting question is the general feasibility of a working surface-to-air missile and potential allied reactions. Although the missiles could be seen as a waste of resources, we should also not forget that the alternatives, besides the fighters, weren't particularly efficient. The question is, could have been a missile be more efficient? Well, let's look at some data. According to a report from the Quartermaster General, for every downed plane, 16,000 shots of the 8.8 cm Flak 36 were needed, 8,500 shots of the Flak 8.841, and 6,000 shots of the 10.5 Flak were necessary. In terms of explosive, this meant 62, 51 and 45 tons were necessary for each downed plane. Note that explosive in this case means both the propellant and the charge in the warhead. In contrast, one missile could require about 2.1 tons of explosives. So if one out of 20 missiles would hit, it would be, have been more efficient than a 10.5 cm flak, at least in terms of explosives. Yet the missile was also a high-end weapon that required high-grade radio equipment and electronics. Additionally, since it was a rather unproven technology, it probably wouldn't have been much more feasible than flak guns for at least a few years. Luckily, we also have some more data, namely about the requirements for a complete missile launch site. Plans from summer 1943 suggest that for the defense of Germany, it would be necessary to have 870 batteries with the Wasserfall or Enzian missiles. 
and 1300 batteries of the Schmetterling. This setup would have required about 100,000 men. Additionally, in order to protect the site against low level attacks, medium and light flak was required, around 5 to 6 kilometers around the site. Furthermore, quite an infrastructure including storage areas, command bunkers, transport vehicles and many other elements would have been necessary. As you can see, the requirements both in men and resources were quite high. Especially considering that in 1943 almost 50% of the flak crew were behalves personnel, substitute or auxiliary personnel. Which means about 400,000 people. As you can see, Although a surface-to-air missile sounds like an efficient weapon at first, the overall requirements, even ignoring development and production, were quite extensive. Now the final question is how could have the Allied reacted to such a missile site, if it would have ever been ready? There were various ways how the Allies could have reacted to properly guided anti-aircraft missiles. For instance, developing various technical countermeasures like chaffs, flares, etc. Yet probably a most likely approach during the late war would have been to just attack the launch site with a large amount of low-flying fighter bombers. After all, the missiles wouldn't be a proper counter, since they were built for bomber interception at high altitudes. And the previously mentioned missile site layout included light and medium flak guns for protection against low-level attacks. Of course, another approach would have been to simply bypass the missile sites. Considering that in 1944 the Allies had various air bases all over Europe, this was a viable low-risk option. Especially since the German transport system was already under constant attack, Thus the redeployment and or construction of a major missile site would have probably incurred significant losses besides the delay. In other words, even if these missiles would have been ready in summer 1944, their impact would have been limited or just diverted some allied air power for a limited amount of time. As always, sources are linked in the description. Special thanks to Bismarck for joining me in this video. Be sure to check out his channel here and this video on German anti-aircraft missiles here. Or if you want to know more about flak towers, check out this video with HD footage. Anyway, thank you for watching and see you next time.